Well, welcome. Today, um, it's my distinct pleasure to have a conversation with Dr. Pete Polverini, who really needs no introduction to our school, but I'll just give a brief overview. Pete did his undergraduate work at Marquette University, went on and obtained his DDS at Marquette. Then he went to Harvard where he did his oral path training as well as a doctorate at DMSC focusing in vascular biology. He started his faculty career at the University of Pittsburgh and then moved to Northwestern uh, where he obtained tenure as an associate professor. And then he was recruited to the University of Michigan as a professor and chair of the oral and maxillofacial pathology department here. And he also uh, had a, an appointment as a professor in Michigan medicine in the department of pathology. He did a, a brief stint at Minnesota as a professor and dean before he was recruited back to Michigan as a professor and the dean of the School of Dentistry. Pete has had a remarkable academic career, really hitting it out of the park in all areas of uh, research, you know, fabulous publications, well-funded, huge amount of service through editorial uh, positions, NIH study sections, professional organizations. Uh, he was, I have to note that he was awarded the Ida Gray Award here at the University of Michigan for his support of diversity. He's also been an honorary professor at many other institutions and he was awarded a distinguished university professorship the University of Michigan, the Jonathan Taft Professorship, as well as distinguished alumnus from both Harvard and Marquette. And uh, finally, I'll just mention that he uh, is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. There's many other accolades. Those are just a few. Pete, thank you for being with me this morning. I really well, look forward. Pleasure. Yeah, I really look forward to our conversation. So let's start out and sure. I'll just ask, how was it that you decided to go to dental school? And then from there, deciding to go the academic route versus uh, private practice. So let me start with why dentistry. Actually, there were two uh, dentists uh, who were very influential in my deciding to go into dentistry as a, as a profession. One was a family dentist who actually happened to be uh, a part-time faculty member at Tufts University. And another was a uh, dentist in um, the community I grew up in in Everett, Massachusetts, who was well-respected and actually had built a medical arts uh, building. And what he did was want me to go into a particular specialty. And he, he had designs of me actually joining his group when I graduated dental school. So both of them were very, very influential. But, but I think what, what decided me, what made decisions I made to go into academics were based on a couple of things. So one was I, I've always had an interested, interest in science, particularly biology since high school. And then when I was uh, an undergrad uh, at, at Marquette, I actually did some independent research in the Department of Anatomy. So I, I had an interest all along about pursuing research. And then, of course, I did that when I was in dental school as well. And that's when I became enamored with pathology as a discipline. And it was at that time that, and, that I decided I really want to pursue that as a profession, as a career track. And, and even today, pathology really plays an important role in informing my research. So again, so it was during my sophomore year in dental school, I started writing to different uh, dental schools and graduate programs to see what was out there, what was available for the sort of things. And I, I was particularly looking for a program where I could do a specialty training as well as research. And I decided about pathology because I felt that that would give me more time for research uh, and then perhaps some of the other disciplines in dentistry. 
So it was my junior year in dental school that I was invited to the Dental Students Conference on Research. I don't know if they still have it anymore. Mm -hmm. But at that time, it was uh, being hosted by the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Uh, little did I know at that time what a life-changing experience that would have on the decision I would make to go into academics. So as fate would have it, I was admitted to the Doctor of Medical Sciences program at Harvard. And uh, I was, uh, again, um, where I would spend the next five years pursuing the discipline of oral and maxillofacial pathology under the direction of Gerald Schlar, who was a real icon in the field. And I did my research, as you said, in vascular biology under Ramsey Cotran, who was then chief of pathology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Now, the, then it was the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital. So that was a few years ago. Uh, so my time at Harvard, I think, was generally transformative. Uh, I was surrounded by some of the best scientists in the world. Frankly, I felt like a kid in a candy store. It was just, it was just unbelievable. You know, as a graduate student is really when I learned the importance of, of being competitive in an academic environment and also the importance of mentorship. So it was Dr. Dr. Schlar Cotran and Michael Gimbroni, who was then a, a, a young assistant professor who worked hand in hand with me when I started as my graduate work. They were perhaps the three most influential people in my career at that time. They were wonderful mentors, but most importantly, they're all really distinguished scientists. So it was the track from my interest in biology, uh, my uh, the two dentists in my community that sort of merged into my decision to go into academics where I could do research and practice dentistry. That's awesome. And you know, I always think pathology is an area that how can you not look at biopsy specimens and not generate a huge number of questions. Sure, that that's right, know, that's right. That you just feel compelled to address. Um, I'm gonna share a couple slides here um, to ask you the next question, because one of the things that has always impressed me about you is that as a faculty member, and then in particular, as a leader, a chair and a dean, you always maintained the faculty role in teaching, service and research. And these are a couple images just showing you teaching and showing your um, diagnostic pathology work. I'm just curious, to what do you attribute being able to continue as a successful faculty member while still navigating significant leadership responsibilities. Okay, so as you mentioned earlier, I mean, I had a brief stint at the University of Pittsburgh and I was recruited uh, uh, at that time uh, by Northwestern University. What they were doing at the time was uh, the pathology department in the medical school had the responsibility of teaching pathology to the dental students at the School of Dentistry. So Dan Scarpelli, who was then chair, recruited me uh, to uh, Northwestern University. And uh, for many reasons, it was a, a great opportunity because it brought us closer to my wife's family in Wisconsin. So it was, a, and with three children, of course, that was a big deal to be able to see grandma and grandpa in Wisconsin. But my, my decision really to continue uh, research was really uh, Dan Scarpelli. He was uh, my, uh, probably one of the more influential mentors as a young assistant professor. And I, and I may remember very clearly when, I, when he met with me after I arrived at Northwest and he says, you know, I, I'm well aware of your skills as a teacher and a diagnostic pathologist, but as if you have to prove yourself to be a, as a competent funded scientist. So uh, he made no bones about it. If I was going to succeed, because at the time I was, if I got promoted in the ranks, it would be in the medical school. And they had a pretty rigorous promotion uh, program at the time. So I also remember Dan Scarpelli sitting with me on a Sunday morning at his home, helping me craft my first R01 uh, application. And he was a tough guy. There's no doubt about it, but he was also kind. And he taught me the importance of what it meant to be a complete faculty member and how to juggle the responsibilities of teaching, uh, uh, 
diagnostic pathology at that time and, and research. And he expected me to do all three well. You know, the idea of the triple threat, well, they, it still is important in many respects. So first and foremost, when it talks about how do I balance the leadership with other things, if you're going to, uh, to me, and I, the best leaders are those who also outstanding faculty. You can't be a great leader unless you're a great faculty member to begin with. And I think they go hand in hand. It's really difficult to make decisions as a leader unless you've sort of been there and done that. So I think that to me, that's very important to, to do it. So that, that's for me, how I sort of juggle those uh, responsibilities. I learned about it uh, from some of the very best people uh, I've, and also uh, taking, making the effort to do what I was expected to do. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think your point about leaders having walked the walk is really important. Yeah, no, it is. And I, and I think it's, it's hard, again, to expect someone to do something that you yourself have not at least made an attempt at. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move forward and this photo with Carol on the Michigan football field makes me think to ask you the question about what, I mean, you've spent more of your career at Michigan than yes. any of those other places, I believe. And I'm curious if you would talk about what sets Michigan apart from other schools? Well, I think I think of really three things that are really important that why Michigan is as good as it is. First of all, the dental school is located within one of the truly great universities in the world. Um, uh, University of Michigan has always aspired to its excellence. It, it, it certainly is a place where innovation is important as well as creativity. So I think being part of a great university uh, is really important. And they expect it's all its schools and colleges to live up to, to the same high standards. And I think that's one of the reasons why the dental school is, is as good as it is. But secondly, uh, the dental school is considered the premier dental school in the country. Uh, and I think that is certainly st stands, sets it apart from most other dental schools, if not all dental schools. And I think the third, the most important aspect of, of this is that excellence at the School of Dentistry is due in large part, if not exclusively, to the faculty, staff, and the students it recruits. So I think all those together really are the reason why Michigan is as great an institution as it is and will continue to be so because it always is a forward thinking school within a forward thinking university. It also, I think has celebrated the importance of diversity, bringing the very best you can bring here. And I think looking through those lenses is another reason why being at Michigan has been such an important part of my life. It, I mean, you're underlying the importance of recruitment for all of those, for Absolutely. faculty, staff, and students to be right. able to Absolutely. maintain that. But you're right; it's 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 all about the people. Yeah, no, you're right. It's that's what makes this place so great. So, you undoubtedly you had a huge impact at Michigan, both as chair and as dean. And many of the faculty that you mentored, you were talking about people who mentored you, but many of the faculty that you mentored went on to be chairs and deans. How do you establish an environment where people can, faculty can be so successful? Well, so let me talk a little bit about leadership. First of all, I think leadership is a trait that is learned. It's a learned behavior. If you have been well mentored, in, in many cases, you will also be a, a good mentor. And when I say a learned trait, what it is that once uh, you aspire uh, to become a leader, uh, what you do is you look at individuals that have influenced you throughout your career. And those have inspired you uh, and have earned your respect are important in shaping you as a potential leader. Um, I, I, be, I really do believe the best leaders are, are those and mentors uh, who have learned from uh, their mistakes over time and it continued to grow and thrive. And again, I think what's really important is when you look at that next generation of leadership, 
that you allow them to learn from their mistakes and support them uh, and to thrive and provide them with the opportunities to be successful. And I think that's really important. But it's also, again, it's important that you uh, make sure that while you provide people with the re uh, responsibilities that you sort of stand back and sort of let them grow on their own, but at the same time, uh, avoid the, uh, the, the opportunity to be, to be controlling. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily want to get in their way, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's like anything else with the child that you're raising or friends, you sometimes you see them sort of walking into blind eye. You, you, the risk is you want to sort of pull them back, but you really got to let them sort of walk into the wall sometimes and let them learn. And so I think the best way is, is to stand back and let really good people thrive uh, at, during their careers. And it's really a skill to know yeah, yeah. when to intervene and when not to. Like right, they right, let right. To allow them to grow. Right. And I mean, I, I, I think one of the things that Michigan does is because of its kind of decentralized nature that allows chairs, for instance, to, to really develop their skill set right? oh, and, right. not, and not have that, you know, micromanagement. So to yeah, speak. yeah. And, and I think, as I said, sometimes it's really hard because, you know, when you see something that may not sort of be going adrift, um, sometimes, I mean, if you have quality people in, in that position, they'll, they'll, they'll see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. So the other uh, image on this slide is when you were awarded membership into the National Academy of Medicine, right? At the time called the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine. And you've always been a huge advocate for scientific endeavors and research in our profession. I'm, I, I'm curious if you would just share some words about the importance of research in our profession. I know you've written on this topic and you've spoke on the topic. Please share a little bit with us. Sure. Well, well, you know, I've said this before. I think a profession that does not encourage or support uh, uh, research and discovery is really no longer a profession. I mean, that's what separates a profession from a craft or a, uh, any other type of discipline is the investment they make in research and discovery. And again, it's important that dentistry take the responsibility for, for creating the new knowledge it needs to advance the profession. Because what you want to avoid is entrusting it to some other discipline that may not necessarily have your best interests at heart. So I think, you know, once again, if, if the profession is going to grow and thrive, if it's going to uh, carve out new areas uh, where it, 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 as it changes over time, it's really got to be the, where the, that research and discovery mission is done within dentistry. And I think uh, it, we're seeing, unfortunately, uh, the difficulty many schools have in creating that mission of research and discovery. But that's what makes Michigan so unique. It's that it's always used that as, as integrated into its educational program. It's not like education, is, it's all really combined uh, where students who graduate from the school understand why research and discovery is important. And I think that plays in a big role in informing their, their practice of dentistry. Yeah, I think the point that you make about if we don't further the knowledge, then we're dependent on some other entities. And if you just think about it from the standpoint of, you know, who those entities would be. So let's say if we don't do it and industry leads that instead, it will clearly be skewed to it being a financial advantage. Sure. And, and not, it'll all be based on self-interest. Right. right. And not necessarily in the best interest of the people that we're serving. Oh, I agree. I agree completely. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, you know, I, I sound like a broken record sometimes when I talk about this to, to other individuals, but I really do believe that uh, um, it, the lifeblood of the profession is the science that it creates. Yeah. Well, it, it, it 
sets us apart as a profession and not as a technical or trade. You're right. Yeah. Correct. That's right. It's really critical. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to share another image here. Um, this one, two images. One, when you received the Guy's Award, and um, the other with Lynn Johnson, and and they both highlight because you obtained you you were awarded the Guy's Award for innovation and vision, and you, in my mind, were an incredible visionary when you were dean and the things that you brought to the school and this highlights um, the the work that you supported of Len Johnson's uh, at the time. I'm curious if you would comment on what areas of the dental profession you think have the most potential for impact in the future? Well, I, I guess if there was one area that I think is going to have a huge impact in the future and is already being seeing in some respects is a whole idea of precision health. You know, for example, precision diagnostics that's predictive of whether or not an individual is gonna develop a, a disease. Um, the idea of risk assessment, which individuals are likely to develop a disease and when you can start treatment early. And finally, customized therapy. You know, can you developing a strategy for treating patients not using the generic strategy that unfortunately we do many times because that's all we what we know today. But can you customize therapy to treat patients that have unique uh, uh, disease processes that you can actually target specifically for them? So I think this whole idea of you know of genomic medicine is is as it continues to grow is going to be part of how, how we educate our students. So we really, so this idea of, of curriculum integrating with the, the next generation of science that's gonna be leading, as we weave that into our curriculum, we wanna make sure our students are prepared for that new science and how it's gonna be applied in their profession. So what they do today in their office, 20, 30 years from now may be entirely different. So I think the School of Dentistry really does a really wonderful job preparing them for that next step in the profession and how it's going to change over time. So the idea of precision health is something I think is really critical and that uh, students are really hearing about, that's for sure. So I know you uh, you lead uh, elective for dental students on precision oral health. Yes. Um, are there other ways that you think as a profession we can be better prepared for you know, embracing this, it seems like it makes total sense. And the examples are becoming more and more clear, but it seems that we should be able to accelerate this. Yeah, well, I, and again, I that depends upon who you have at the helm of, at an institution that sees the value of this science as is emerging. I think it's also dependent upon uh, faculty who actually want to really dis dis discuss this in the context of their particular discipline. Um, and it's also got to be students who are open to something new. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to predict whether or not you will have that type of student. But I think for the most part, I've seen students who really see exploring new opportunities within the practice environment as something that's really exciting. Yeah. And I think uh, I think all those three uh, come into play. I mean, so leading as a as a as a school and a university are those that are willing to take the risk and start to think differently about how the dentistry is practiced today and slowly but surely weaving that into the curriculum. So the students really get a, a sense of really what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. And and I think, you know, probably it's OK that it's just a, a small number at first, right? It, Correct. You know, but if if we can show progress and show impact, then that can, you know, can blossom from there. Well, for example, the work that's being done in karyology here at the School of Dentistry about minimally invasive dentistry, looking at new strategies to prevent caries. I mean, that's all part of precision health. Yeah. Exactly. So because we're doing like it right said, now. The risk, looking at the risk profiles and that's determining, right. yeah, it's yes. yeah. 
So in some respects, we're already doing it. Yeah, I think going along with that is a need for data science, right? Yes. To, to be able to in, make those informed decisions with data sets to identify the best approach for an individual requires a huge amount of data points, right? Oh yeah, no, so the idea of, of big data, the idea of, uh, of informatics and its impact on denture, that's only gonna continue to grow. And I mean, if we're gonna be able to sort of integrate all this knowledge and make sense of it, we need people on board who really can help us do that by sorting through all, you know, the idea of, of using machine learning uh, to explore new opportunities. Uh, I mean, you could sit for the next hour just to list the different things that are happening in science that are impacting the profession of dentistry and medicine. Yeah. And I think that's what makes being in, being in the profession of dentistry really exciting. Yeah. So speaking of precision health, uh, this is your book on personalized oral health care, which I believe it, it, it was the first and yes. I'm still the only book in this space. So yes. This is not a, um, a plug, but um, of course, if you haven't read it yet, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's a great resource. Um, this also shows you with Jacques Noor, and it, you know, it reminds me of what you were saying before on the importance of mentorship, but I, it also leads me to my next question, which is, what advice do you have for dental students that are interested in leadership roles as their careers unfold? So part of the reason why I'm doing these interviews is in association with an elective that I run on leadership and having students be exposed to different leaders in our field. And so I always like to ask the question, you know, from a dental student standpoint, what can they do to prepare themselves for a leadership role? Well, I, well, I, I think, you know, if you're going to be a leader, you need to lead. And I think dental students should not hesitate to take advantage of those opportunities if they arise. You know, and, and again, as I said before, it's a learned behavior. So the more opportunities you take to sort of take that step beyond what you think your skills are, uh, the, the, the greater value you're going to have to yourself and to the profession you work in. I, and again, you can learn to be a good leader by emulating those individuals that you respect. And I think, again, any opportunity, it doesn't have to be some major decision that you're making. It could be something small. It could be sort of leading a discussion group. It could be sort of leading, you know, making sure that when you're, when you're doing clinical dentistry, that you're taking the lead and sort of doing the very best you can for your patient by, by doing things in, in, a, in, a, in a way that is enhancing the overall health of that patient. Understanding, you know, the idea of how oral health informs general health as well. So, so making that part of your, uh, how you approach your patient is an example of leadership as far because you're doing something that is very different. I really like the concept that you're talking about, which um, in my mind speaks to, you know, for a current student, putting themselves outside their comfort zone, right, so to speak, and, yes. you know, is an example of a step towards a leadership role. And that, and that they shouldn't think about it from the standpoint of, okay, you know, they're just working, 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 and sure. all of a sudden somebody comes along and bestows them, you know, yeah. some award. Right. No, but it's little steps, you know, things at it, you one step at a time that will continue to foster this overall leadership path that then they will be selected for significant leadership roles because they've shown this history of taking on, stepping you know, out in front of the crowd, so to speak, and, uh, and showing their leadership skills. No, I, I agree. I think you know, they're gonna be, have opportunities to, to provide leadership in their communities. Uh, you know, uh, it, and I think it, coming from a school where leadership is really important, and where there's plenty of examples of successful leaders at the school, 
I think only sets them up for a, few, a very bright future and many opportunities for leadership. What, what other final words do you have, things that you might wanna share with? Well, I guess what I could say, I, I feel really blessed to be part of a wonderful profession and out in an outstanding university and dental school that always strives to be the best. And I think that's why being here at Michigan has been so important for me as an individual, personally, as well as for my career development. It's always striving to be the very best. And I couldn't think of being in any other place but Michigan for the rest of my career, that's for sure. Thank you, Pete. It, you know, I always enjoy talking with you. Uh, the, the one thing that we didn't bring up that I always say, and I noticed because uh, we were together talking recently, I've always appreciated your sense of humor. And, and, and it just seems like you have a, a, a really positive, upbeat demeanor that has served you well. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being a great dean and a great role model for me, and um, also a huge support um, as I moved into the dean role. And over these last eight years that I've been dean, you've been just fabulous. Well, I, I thank you very much. It's been my pleasure, for sure. Well, thank you. And uh, as we say in Ann Arbor, go blue. <laughs>